probably no secret to anyone that we live in a status conscious society. If you want to cause a stir, you might update your status on Facebook or whatever social media you use. And if you recall, as I had highlighted uh, in the last couple of Sundays, as we looked at some of the background of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, that status was a big thing, for, or sorry, to the Philippians. Status was a big thing for the Philippians. They had this status as a Roman colony, which made them citizens of Rome rather than subjects of the emperor. They had uh, great wealth as a city. It was a center of trade. And so they had a particular status. They were, they were, in, they were used to being well regarded. And so we read these words from Philippians chapter 2 against that backdrop of the, the status mindset that they had. And these words tell us that Christ didn't consider his status as something to be, to be held on to at all costs. And in fact, that he willingly emptied himself. He set aside his divine status and became human. He, he wasn't the type of king that the Greco-Roman culture of his day was familiar with. He wasn't like Caesar. He wasn't the type of, of messianic king that most of his own people, the Jews, expected. He wasn't an emperor like Caesar. He wasn't concerned to elevate himself, even beyond being a different sort of king than the people of his day could comprehend. He showed in the flesh the conception of God that simply blew away all other categories of what people thought God was all about. And in doing so, in lowering himself or emptying himself, as Philippians says, he, he redeemed humanity. Not by separating himself from humanity, but by uniting himself with humanity and, and taking on all of its burdens and struggles and brokenness but also raising up humanity to all that it could be, all that God had created it to be and all God intended it to be from the beginning. The culture of the day diminished the worth of humanity in many ways, in the way that our culture does today as well. Diminished the worth of humanity in, it, in the bodily life in particular it was inconceivable to people in this day and age that God could or even want to become human. And yet, that's what Christ did. There were beliefs in society of the day, in Paul's society, in the Philippian society, about what kings were supposed to look like and, and how they were supposed to act, what they were supposed to do or, or not do. There were concepts or ideas and they gave foundation to the structure of society. And if you questioned those beliefs or those ideas, it would put you on a collision course with the powers of the day. The world of Paul's day and the world of our day offer not just competing worldviews, but what Jamie Smith calls competing cultural liturgies. There are liturgies that are these, these habits that have this way of forming us for good or for ill. And what Paul is doing in these, through these words, this hymn, most scholars believe it is a hymn, to the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. He's asking them to, to channel, to reset their lives, to reorient themselves and their desires toward Christ and his kingdom and not the kingdoms of this world. In a sense, he's, he's inciting a protest against the cultural liturgy of his day which said that the emperor was a god and that by proclaiming a commitment to another king, to Jesus Christ, you were protesting against 
the emperor. And it's worth asking ourselves, what is our cultural liturgy? You know, what's, what's the prelude to the, your day? What are those habits that, set, that you've set in place that, that sort of dictate how you understand yourself and your place in the world? What's your cultural liturgy look like? What's the, the prelude to your day? Is it the morning stock report so that we can measure off how, measure how well off we are financially? Is it the news headlines which often do nothing but ramp up our anxiety and despair? Or is it time with the Lord in scripture and prayer and quiet? This hymn, these words from Philippians chapter 2, as I said, are a protest against the emperor cult, against the citizenship of Rome in contrast to the citizenship in the kingdom of heaven that Paul highlights later. And to live in the way that this hymn calls us to live is to live, in a sense, a life of protest against against the sinfulness and the brokenness of the world. And to, and to say, not just through our words, but through our actions, that, that we're citizens of a different kingdom. And just as there was an empire in Paul's day, there's an empire in our day as well. And what these Christians, what these Christians in Philippi were, were called to do by Paul, instead of espousing the divinity of an emperor, a Roman emperor who, who proved his divinity by, by virtue of his military conquests and his cultural achievements and architectural triumphs, what Paul does instead is, is hold up the example of Jesus Christ as king. He didn't need to prove his divinity He didn't need to to point to his accomplishments, but instead he served in humility rather than conquering in arrogance. Christ was a king, but for Christ, the cross, the ultimate symbol of his humility, came before the crown. And that's true of citizens of his kingdom too. The cross comes before the crown. You know what got Christians in trouble in, in their day and age was that was not so much that they worshipped a different god. There were all sorts of deities in the ancient world. What got Christians in trouble was that they insisted on worshipping only one god and proclaiming only one king. They, they said that there was another king, Jesus Christ, who didn't exalt himself, but one that instead emptied himself and that God exalted him. And that his followers were those who were ready to be emptied so that they could then be filled with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It was possible in that day and age to have it both ways for most people. But Christians proclaimed an exclusive allegiance to Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying that, in a sense, too. He's saying, you have to make a choice here. You you don't get to have it both ways. You can only have one Lord. And that Lord is the one who emptied himself and was then filled. And we as his people are those who've been emptied and filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't grasp or or hold on to his status, his equality with God as as the Son of God. He was sure enough of his status that he didn't need to grasp it. He knew that it couldn't be taken away from from him. Just the way our status in Christ can't be taken away from us. One, One of the beautiful things about baptism is that it proclaims to us a God a father who loves us and who said that love will not change. That love is forever. And today as we celebrate Eloise's baptism, we celebrate and we remember all of our baptisms. That the words that were spoken to her this morning were also spoken to each one of us 
And in that, as we come to know that, we also come to realize that we're called to be emptied. Baptism is an, an emptying, but it's also a filling. Emptying of ourselves, of our desires, and a filling with the Holy Spirit and a desire for Christ in his kingdom. Jesus didn't grasp those things that, that were his by right. And in fact, Caesar was the one who grasped and held on to things like territory and status and wealth. And what Paul is doing here in these, these words in, in Philippians chapter 2, he's saying that Jesus is the anti-Caesar. Caesar's a pretender to the throne, and Jesus is the true, sovereign, benevolent, humble king of all people. Jesus made himself nothing. But really, in the end, what he does is to show that the things, the, the values of the dominant cultural liturgy of his day or of ours, it's those things, really, that are nothing. And that all the grasping that we do is futile. That the things that we grasp for can't be held on to as possessions, but only received as gifts. And only what God fills us with will endure, will be exalted. God's given Jesus the name Lord, not Caesar. When a Caesar dies, you see, he's still dead. Only Jesus, Paul says, is the one who's triumphed over death and made a way through the despair and the darkness. And he calls us in baptism to die to ourselves. But death to ourselves doesn't mean that we become nothing. In fact, it's really only in dying to ourselves that we become something, that we become those new creations in Christ because we receive his grace and that's what fills us as we're emptied of ourselves. And only by realizing and embracing and following the way of Christ who became nothing are we filled with new life. And not only are we filled with new life, we're given a new calling. A new calling to worship and serve God and to serve one another. We're called to take up the cross just as Jesus did so that we too may receive the crown. We're called to empty ourselves of everything so that we may be filled by God with the fullness of life. There are all sorts of ways and all sorts of things that we might use to fill ourselves. The, the f famous philosopher Blaise Pascal said that there is a God-shaped hole in every human heart. And we desperately try to fill it up with things that will never satisfy. In the beginning of new life, in many ways, and, it, and it's not just a one-time thing, probably for most of us, it's something we have to learn and relearn and relearn. The beginning of new life is, is realizing the emptiness of all those other things that we try to fill up that God-shaped hole with. And, and, and maybe you're here this morning and you realize that emptiness in your life. There are people here who would, who would love the opportunity to talk with you about how it is that Jesus will come into that emptiness and fill it with his grace and love. But God desires not just to change the ways in which we think, but also to change our hearts, not just our thoughts, but also our desires, to empty us of everything that competes for our commitment and to fill us completely with the mind, the attitude, the soul, the spirit. That word in Greek is, is suke. It means all those things, the internal disposition of our hearts, the things we think about, the things that we long for, to fill that with the mind of Christ. As Paul says 
later on in his letter to the Philippians. We are united with Christ in his life and his death and, his we- and also united with him in his resurrection and given a share in his mission by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we're emptied of ourselves, we're filled with Christ. And in being filled with Christ, we join with all creation and we bend our knee and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. By God's grace, through his humility, through his willingness to be emptied, Jesus restored a broken world and he redeemed a lost and fallen human race, not by separating himself from it, not by dictating from on high, but by living as one of us, by embracing our humanity. He came into this world and he began a campaign to renew and restore all things. He reclaimed God's kingdom and established his rule. He conquered sin and death and brokenness, not by crushing it from above, but by undermining it from beneath. He embraced our human condition and humility. And he spent most of his time with people on the margins of society, people who were poor, powerless, without many marketable skills. They were, they were the losers in the birth lottery. They were without privilege or position in society. People with disease or addictions, people who were disabled, people thought not to be capable of much that was of any consequence. But just as Jesus exploded all of the categories about what a king and a messiah was supposed to be, he also exploded all the conceptions that the powerful and the well-connected and the capable had about the kinds of people that this king hung around with. And he told them that by believing in him and following his way, that they would become citizens of his kingdom, a title with dignity and a sense of calling and purpose. And friends, that is who we are. That is who we are through baptism. We are marked as citizens of Christ's kingdom. And baptism calls us to take up the cross so that we may receive a crown on that day when we meet Christ face to face and in turn then lay it down at the feet of Jesus so that he receives all glory and honor and praise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Good and loving God, we thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who dwelt with you in heavenly glory. Out of love for a lost and rebellious people, set aside all that was his by right, became one of us in the most humble of circumstances born to a poor young couple in a backwater province of the Roman Empire. And by his life and death and resurrection, restored us to our relationship with you. Renewed all things. And established a kingdom not of this world, but a kingdom that will come and that we see manifesting itself in ordinary ways each and every day.
Lord, we pray that you would give us the eyes to see that kingdom, the hearts that long for and desire that it grow and deepen and expand, and the gifts that you promise that will enable us to live as faithful citizens of your kingdom, that will allow us to be faithful to the calling that we've each received in our baptism. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.